For me, wisdom is the number one character trait that I wish to develop. And so when I think to myself, I am wise because I use the same formula that most people and most of us, myself included, use to destroy ourselves with these insecurities. And instead of saying an affirmation, you tell yourself the story of why what you're saying is true. You learn to argue against your own thoughts. And that's how you start developing this muscle, this traits that start to become a whisper and then a shout. If you are a patient person, if you are a kind person, if you are an integrous person, if you are a hardworking person. We all have these stories that we tell about ourselves. If you have a limitation right now on your character traits, you don't feel like you are patient enough. You feel like you are too easily distracted. You feel like you don't focus enough. Then you need to start telling yourself the story. I am this way because not I am wealthy. Stupid. In my opinion, I think our brains are too smart for that stuff. You have to give it the reasons. You have to make the argument. And I think instead of affirmations, if you make affirmations into arguments that you make with yourself every day, then those become things that will change who you are. And if you change who you are and how you make decisions, you'll change your entire life and you'll be able to watch your business grow as a result of who you have become. Need motivation? Watch a top 10 with Believe Nation. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael and I make these videos because in my first business, I struggled to stay afloat. I quit my business partner and the thing that kept me going was studying the stories of famous entrepreneurs and seeing how they struggled and seeing what they had to overcome and listen to their wisdom, motivation, gave me the courage, the strength, the belief to go one more day and see my business through. And in all honesty, I still need the inspiration, wisdom, motivation today for my business too. So today, let's learn from one of the best, Alex Hermosi, and my take on his top 10 rules of success. Enjoy. And so this is one of the things that was most powerful for me in my entrepreneurial journey. I, t I had had tons of insecurities, right? I had tons of anxieties. I had lots of anger. I had lots of perceived trauma. And I'll say it that way because I don't even want to make it into trauma. That's just what I perceived as trauma because I was a child in the world with the, the, regu the emotional regulation of a child. And so things of course affect you more when you're a kid. Everyone's traumatized, traumatized, perceives trauma as a child. Like if I go to a stage and I say, hey, who here had a traumatic childhood in some instance or had a traumatic event occur? Everyone's gonna raise their hand. So stop thinking that because you have trauma, and I don't say this, I'll say this with, I'll say it this way better. For me, I chose to stop giving trauma power. And I think if you can do that and you can tell yourself a different story about why you are who you are and make arguments instead of affirmations, you'll be able to have stronger, faster change in the direction that you desire and you'll have more control over your emotional state. And then in so doing, you'll be able to level up the business that you have. Because most of the times when I see business owners, the reason they're not successful is not because they don't have the beliefs or because they don't have the skills. It's just because of who they are. Rule number two is own your circumstances. I think the difference between like rich people and poor people, successful people, not successful people is the degree to which they attribute or give power to their circumstance, right? And so the difference between a self-made billionaire who started with nothing and someone who else started with nothing is not the resources, obviously, because they both started at zero. So what else is it? Is their resourcefulness, not the resources? And so um, if we give power to circumstance, then we cast power outside of ourselves. If we give power to other people, we cast power outside of ourselves. Um, and so it's, you know, it's controlling the controllable. Uh, and when I, you know, when I say that quote, a lot of that is, is how, that quote is how I see selling. It's people cast power to their circumstances and my job is to get them to unfuck themselves around the power that they have just cast to something they cannot control. And so if I can just get them to own, even just own the fact that they suck, that's good enough because they actually can own it and there is pride in that. You can take pride in the fact that you admit that there's a deficit, right? But there is, the only thing you can't take pride in is casting and being a victim, right? Like no one moves forward. Even if you're right, it doesn't serve you, right? If you're born with one, you know, one less leg than you should, you're right, you're not gonna be, you have a disadvantage at being a sprinter. <laughs> like you have a disadvantage. But it doesn't serve you in any way to admit it. And so it's, it's owning the fact that like you are the only person who can actually change anything about your life because you may blame your circumstances but no one else will care. 
Rule number three is embrace your anger. When I was 15, 16, 17, I was a pretty angry kid. I thought that I had all these issues. I would tell people I have anger issues. I'm not a nice person. I would tell people those things because I believed those things to be true and I saw them as problems. And then I went to college and in college it's all propaganda of people who are teaching who've never actually done work in a real economy ever. They're all tenured, they don't live in reality. And they tell everyone they should pursue their purpose and their passion and the things that he loved, and I ate it up. And so I read all these books on positive psychology, I watched all these TED Talks, and the problem was I didn't make any progress. And I felt like there was something even more wrong with me because I didn't feel any of that stuff. I wish I could go back and tell myself, dude, all of the stuff they're saying is just not true. Like, you don't need any of that. You can embrace the fact that you are angry, you can embrace the fact that you feel like you are in pain, and you can use that to make the life that you want. You don't have to use the lovey-dovey purpose passion to build the life that you want to build. What it does is it tells people that having a negative emotional experience is a bad thing. But half of your life is below average by definition. And so if you are not using the half of your life as energy or motivation to create the life you want, then you're at a huge disadvantage. They interviewed the top Olympic medalists and they found that they don't actually love winning. They hate losing. When they win, they experience relief, not euphoria. If you look at Steve Jobs, he wasn't some happy-go-lucky dude who was like, man, I just want to make the world a better place. He was a tough dude to work for, but he created something beautiful from that pain. MJ, you look at Kobe, they had imaginary situations that they created in their mind to create more suffering in their own lives to motivate them and use as fuel. Imagine you have this big vision for your life that you want, and on this side, your family gets kidnapped, and if you don't do something, they will kill them all. Which of those motivates you more right now in this video? Probably the one with your family getting kidnapped. It's not trying to harness a lovey-dovey feeling. It's harnessing pain. Felt like I had experienced more pain than I had good. I saw it as a disadvantage. I saw it as something that I had to overcome. I didn't have this big purpose. I didn't have this thing that I loved. I didn't have this thing I was passionate about. And if I could have just skipped all of that, and started the moment I accepted that it was okay to be angry. What wasn't okay was not doing anything about it. While I procrastinated by trying to find purpose, jumping from thing to thing to thing, trying to find the thing that really lit my fire, and just accepted that it was totally okay to work my face off in disgust from my current circumstance and who I was, then I would have gotten to where I wanted to go much faster. So many people are believing a lie. They have to be happy, they have to have purpose, passion for what they're doing in order to get out of their situation. They think that they are poor because they don't have passion. That is false. You are poor because you're not doing the activities that make you rich. And you can fuel those activities whatever way you damn well please. And so if you are somebody who is more motivated by the dark side, then lean into the dark side. Unlike the saying, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, the equal opposite of that is the road to heaven is paved with bad intentions. You can do good shit with bad motivation. And when I say bad, I mean negative experiences, pain, anger, etc. I still have tons of motivation from that side. You can use that negative fuel Hit it on speed dial. Every time you're confronted with that thing that you don't want to do, you push through it, and what happens, you do that enough times, you start to get good at the thing. You start seeing the result of work that has compounded and start to see a purpose or start to see a bigger vision. The big vision for Alex's life until maybe four years ago was don't be broke. What was your mission with Jim? My mission was to stop being poor. There are elements of shit that I do that I absolutely love, but there is tons of shit that I do every day that I Hate, I just don't hate it more than I hate the alternative. And the richest people in the world, they all say it's not about the money. Because if it's about the money, you stop the moment you have enough. The people who are the wealthiest in the world have the three things in common. They have the big goal, they have massive fears about never being enough, and then they have impulse control to stay on goal. And oftentimes that impulse control comes from right as you approach the guardrail, looking over the edge and imagining what it would be like to have your friends tell you that you were a failure, or have them laugh behind your back or talk down about you, or have your parents when they're introducing you as their fun-loving kid. You know, he's still figuring himself out. That is what would crush me. The boring 
that you have to do is not fun. Jeff Bezos talks about overhead in business. There's tons of things that you have to do and be willing to do that you do not enjoy. The question is whether you do not enjoy them more then you do not enjoy the pain that you are going away from. As long as the pain of moving forward is less than the pain of going back and the pain that you imagine from not taking the action that you know should be taking, then you can use that energy as the single fuel that you can stay on path for an extended period of time. I'm writing my book right now. I'm on the 11th draft. Like there is no feeling that makes me more sick than the idea that I could have done more. The pain of the idea of that book not doing well or that book leading to people being like, I don't think he tried as hard. That is the thing that hurts so much more than going from the top yet again to make another video, to make another article, to make another short, to make another chapter revision yet again so that when I do launch it, I think to myself, I literally exhausted every option on this. One of the sayings that I live by is that I will not do my best, I will do what is required. And the difference between what your best is and what is required is the difference between what you think your real best is and what your actual best is. And what your actual best is is the thing that you would do to prevent everyone you know from dying. What people care about is the outcome, what you put out in the world. Now, why you do it, what fuels you, that's your business. And so if you are in one of these situations and you can't find that purpose, you can't find that passion, cool. But it doesn't give you permission to not be successful. Rule number four is be driven. You go from in your late teens and early 20s, kind of living your dad's life, going to school, being yeah. a management consultant, yeah. the whole kind of Iranian work ethic, yeah. become a doctor, all that stuff. And then at 22, you decide, no, uh, peace out. I'm not doing this. And, and your dad feels you're making this giant mistake. Of course. Um, but, then, but then what I loved about that story was that he comes back and gives you his, his only ever apology to you yeah. uh, for saying it was a mistake. What did you, what did you have to do to then ultimately make him proud that he apologized to you? Well, I mean, it, there's, pro there's probably layers to this, you know I mean? Everyone's relationship with their parents are, are different, but for me, at least my, my dad, he, he was very much a material success guy. Um, like every time he introduced somebody, like before he got in the car, after he got in the car, he'd be like, oh, this is so-and-so, this is how much money he makes. Right. And so it was very clear whether he said it consciously or unconsciously, like that money was what to him is what was most respectable about someone. Um, he would probably not like me saying that, but not through his words, but through his actions, it became clear to me that that is what he valued. And so for me to gain the affirmation or, or the approval of my father, I had to make money, but he also has his, you know, his own ego and his own pride and whatnot. And so it couldn't be like, I just have to match the amount of money that he makes. It's like, I had to make more money than he'd ever made in his entire life, um, for that to really solidify. And we're both pretty, um, domineering personalities. And so we had to, there was like a five year period where we didn't talk too much. Um, and there, I think there had to be a power shift, um, that had to occur. And it only really occurred when, uh, the, the, the evidence was overwhelming. Um, and so like when I started making money, um, I mean, I think the first year that we made like $10 million, uh, he was like, well, we'll see how long it lasts. Like it wasn't, you know what I mean? So like it, 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 it wasn't just like, you have to make more money. It was, it was, it had to be so insurmountable, the evidence that it was undeniable. And so I think that that's also been a theme that, that I apply to a lot of the facets of my life is that just through my own insecurities, um, I wanted to create, uh, you know, different, different pillars of my life that would be successful, quote, like beyond reproach so that no one could say like, well, Alex is in good shape. It's like, no, he's in such crazy shape that no one can say that he's overweight. Right. Or, you know, he's, he's, he's not just like doing okay, but he's making so much money that no one can say that he's not successful. And I think honestly, that's just because of my own insecurities. I don't think that's a, a testament to anything besides that. Um, and I may still harbor those and I just have evidence that that allows me to function, you know, better, uh, uh, you know, and live, a, live in a more normal lifestyle rather than continually suffer uh, from those just because those, that evidence acts as a crutch against the insecurities that I have. Also, to make sure you're actually taking action after watching this video, I've designed a special free worksheet just for this video. The worksheet will highlight all of the lessons learned in this video, as well as pull out our three favorite learnings and quotes that will inspire you to actually do something. The worksheet will also give you space to write down what your key takeaways are and your specific plan of action to make sure you're getting results. If you want the worksheet designed specifically for this video, absolutely for free, there's a link in the description below. Go click on it and start building the momentum in your life and your business. I'll see you there.
Rule number five is build successful traits. There's three traits that people then they looked at because they were trying to find habits of highly successful people. And when they actually pulled apart, it's not, you know, and I hope I'm not con con contradicting anything. Um, but there's people who are really rich who wake up really late and work really late. And there's people really rich who wake up really, really early. And there's people who are really rich who eat really healthy. And there's people really rich who drink Coca-Cola and eat French fries every day. Mm -hmm. And so there's all these things that we want to make as truths, but there there's easy examples that counter those things. So it's like, what are the few things that are true, or at least that seem to be present in all of the situations? And it seems as though there were surprisingly few. And so the three common traits that they had, or that they had found were one, that people have a superiority complex. They believe they're better than others, and they believe that they deserve more than everyone else does, and that they can accomplish big goals, mm -hmm. right? So they have a bigger vision because they believe they deserve it, or whatever it is, that they were able to identify that. The second thing that they would identify is that they had crippling insecurity, and <laughs> which, which is a paradox of paradoxes. They feel they'll never be enough, um, and they'll always be measured against the things that they've achieved. And so you've got this crazy dynamic between they they think they're better than everyone, they think they deserve more, they want to go after this big hill, and at the same time, they fear they'll never be good enough, and they'll never actually achieve it, and they actually suck. Mm. And then the third piece, which kind of adds the beautiful like mix of this, is impulse control. Yeah. And so they're able to control their actions and focus on a single thing for an extended period of time. And so if you put those three things together, it's like you've got a big goal that's pulling you this way, you've got this big fear that you are running away from, and then you've got impulse control to keep you focused on the one thing that matters. Yes. And if you do that, if you, if you are the type of person who, who has those traits, then you are very likely to be successful. Rule number six is add leverage. I'm wondering from your first 10,000 to then like, and not just you, like maybe prescriptive advice yeah. now, and then let's add a zero each time. So 10,000 to 100,000, a million, like what's the mindset shift that I have to go by adding a zero to my revenue every step of the long way so I don't get stuck? It's a, it's a really good question. So when you're adding zeros, you're, you're, you're adding an order of magnitude, right? So it's a multiple you know, of 10 that's happening with each of those scenarios. And the only way you can really add an order of magnitude is not by doing 10 times more work, but by adding leverage, right? And so we have to have leverage to the things that we do. And so you know, in the beginning, you transition from being employed to being self-employed, right? And so that's like kind of the first transition. And then your, your limit is going to be your time and how much you can bill per hour, right? Um, from there, your, your next level is going to be building the core team, which is usually five, you know, five or so people, which will be representative of departmental functions within a company, right? You'll have some element of promotion, some element of selling, some element of customer service, some element of finance and things like, like, and that would probably, and then you are kind of managing in that you're not really, t really leading yet. You're really just managing the people below you. And in that, in that time, typically you are better at the job at each of those roles than the people beneath you, because you cannot afford people who will be better than you at those roles. From there, adding another level of leverage, you then add another layer of management that goes, and then you really transition into being a leader because you can't possibly, so like each of those people now have five people underneath of them, right? Now you're, now you're at, you know, 25 or 30 people. And most of the, um, most of the stagnation points do happen uh, around triplings. Um, and that's usually because another whole layer of infrastructure needs to get built within a company. Um, and so that's where people don't know what has to happen. And so that's when you go, you know, and once you're a leader, you have to go into like kind of step into the visionary role and you're really hiring people who come with batteries included solutions already having proven inside of them. Not, I have to go find some person, teach them how to manage a sales team, teach them how to recruit, like, no, no, like you're finding somebody who's already built a 30 person sales team to help you build, take your, take your five person to a 30 person sales team, right? It's like, you want to find somebody who's already run the Olympic gold and then have them run it with you rather than like, Oh, I'm a running coach. I've never run gold, but I'll try and do it with you. And the thing is, is that when you're earlier on, the, the reason it's difficult is because you can't afford some of those people yet. And so that's why early on you have to spend a disproportionate amount of your time learning the skills, right? Rather than, um, rather than hiring people who already have those skills. So in the beginning, you're learning and your ability to learn is the bottleneck. And later, it's your ability to recruit people who have learned. And so it's just like in business where you can buy or you can build, like in terms of growing through mergers and acquisitions. So this is really going from top down. At, at, a, at a medium level, you can buy or build talent. You can buy talent by paying premium dollar for the best people, or you can build it. And both of those are strategies. You can build a, a system for, for, design, for designing and training salespeople. That was something that we were really good at. And so we could take people for less than top dollar and then make them into top dollar salespeople, right? Now, the, the risk that you have there is that some people then start recruiting your salespeople because right? <laughs> you, you did the building for them. But it just depends on the strategy of the business in term, you know, overall. And so um, in terms of going from 10K to uh, 100K a month, to a million a month, to 10 million a month, 
each of those represent orders of magnitude um, on leverage that you can employ within the business. And I'll just finish with one little thing. I know I just ran it a little bit. Um, but the the leverage, uh, and this is from Naval Ravikant. This isn't me, but I remember the four C's. He, he doesn't say four C's. I remember four C's because otherwise I can't remember it. But it's like you've got you've got code, you've got content, you've got collaboration, you've got capital, right? And so collaboration is the base of that pyramid of just getting other people to do stuff for you. So you get time back by having other people give you their time and you pay them for it, right? The level above that is capital. You use other people's money to fuel growth, right? And if you know how to structure your business properly, you can also use your customer's money to fuel growth if you, prop, if you, if you monetize well in that you can, if you can set up your, your marketing and your sales system such that you can make more money than it costs you to acquire a customer and the next customer within the first 30 days, you have a negative acquisition cost, which means you can use that money to then go get more customers. And you basically have a limitless acquisition cycle. Now, you'll still have bottlenecks, but there'll be infrastructure bottlenecks on the back end. So there's always a bottleneck, but it, it no longer becomes acquisition. So you have collaboration, then you have capital, and then the top two are, are content and code. So you have software, which has zero cost of replication, which gives you limitless leverage. And to the same degree, like what you've done, uh, with media, right, content, uh, it doesn't cost more money for more people to see this. Like if you and I were on here with just one person or you and I are on here with a million people, it costs the same amount for us to do it, but we have leverage. And so with most businesses, and this is like a fun rule of thumb for anybody who's looking, when you look at the biggest businesses that have been around the longest, they typically will have all four of those aspects um, of leverage built within the business. Like you look at Facebook, they have, they have lots of people, they have capital from the outside, they sell media based on code, right? Um, and so as you're looking to scale the company, it's like, how many boxes of these leverage can I check? And I would even look at my own life and I would say right now we have three of the four. Like I don't have a big software component within my business, but we do have media. We do have uh, collaboration and we do have capital. And so I think that for us, and I made a presentation about this, like I think for us going from 10 million a month to maybe hundred million a month, I'll probably have to figure out some sort of code thing. Uh, but at, you know, at current, uh, we're able to, you know, still do 10 million a month with the stuff that we're doing. Rule number seven is love what you do. To compete against the people, if you're like, I really want to make money, but you don't really like business, I think it's like I started in fitness and then I realized I had a deeper passion for business. Like I liked it more than I liked fitness. And I and I was obsessed wow. with fitness for a long time. But like when I, I like the day I started my gym was the day fitness became number two, and then business became my first love. Um, and I'm still, you know, in my love affair, you know, with business, <laughs> my long-term relationship with business. And it's because like, like the only way you're going to beat everybody else is, is to truly love it. And if you don't, I think it's very difficult to do that. And I think it's just like maybe picking another metric or different bone to gnaw on. Um, but I had, I have one quick thing. I was pulling it up while you were, um, we were talking about the art thing earlier. So like a lot of marketers will talk about how their products are amazing. Right, like how many times have you heard people like, no, 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 no. Our, our course is awesome, our program's awesome, right. or whatever, right? They say that. But the thing is, is like, and I've I've done this at like a couple of like workshops I've been invited to. And I'm like, all right, who here knows what their, you know, their CPM, their CTR, their, you know, their their CPL, like their set percentage, their close rate, their CPA, their CAC, like what who who knows all those numbers? Everyone's like, oh yeah, uh hundred uh-huh, percent. I'm like, cool. I'm like, what's your what's your TTV? What's your CHS? What's your NPS? What's your churn? What's your activation points? What are C or C? And they're like, what? I'm like, right. So how can you say you have a good product and you don't even know what the metrics are to track good product? Rule number eight is get over hurdles. We're big fans of imperfect action. And so and I think that we're also, at least I'm a big student of like you learn through doing, not through preparing to do. Uh, because I think a lot of times you learn as you're doing what things you thought were important at the onset are significantly less important. So it's like, you know, I think the thumbnails and the headlines and the first, you know, 20 seconds matter a lot more than spending an hour setting up the lighting. You know what I mean? And so it's just like return on time and effort. Um, and so, yeah. So, I mean, if we want to learn something new, at least in the companies that we have, it's like we just start doing, we pull we pull the thread that we can see and we just keep pulling and figure it out as we go. And I think we end up getting to where we're trying to go faster um, just through ex- giving ourselves permission to suck. Rule number nine is enjoy the climb. When people understand the game, when you understand that I can never take a drink so thirst quenching that right. I'll never need another drink again. There's right. no meal yeah. so amazing that you'll never be hungry again. There's no sex so good yeah. that you'll never want sex again. It just That's just the way the human animal is wired. Like when people are at peace with that, yeah. ah, like then now you've really got a shot at loving your life, 
understanding the cycles and that you're yeah. gonna keep doing the climb and so you better love the climb. I love the, uh, the, the that moment before the moment. So I was, I, like I was, I was thinking, as you were saying, I was thinking back to like the few of those moments that I've had, like the first time, you know, you start running ads and like you start getting your first lead, you're like, holy sh it's working. Yeah. Like it's that, you know what I mean, that moment. Or the first, I remember uh, when I got, uh, I hired my first salesperson and they closed a sale and I wasn't there. Mm. So it was the first person that had made me money who wasn't me. Yep. And I was like, I pulled over the side of the road and I teared up because I was like, it doesn't have to just be me anymore. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so like, I've, I was just thinking about all these, these moments that I've had. Um, I remember when we were, Layla and I were sitting over the, the kitchen counter and we had just switched from uh, flying out a sales team in person to do these turnarounds uh, to switching to licensing. And um, I got on the phone to tell the guys who I was gonna launch the next month that we weren't gonna do that anymore. We're thinking about switching directions. And so I said, hey, you know what? I can't do it, but I'll, I'll I'll tell you how I do it, but I'm not flying out there anymore. And they were like, oh, that's fine. How much? And I didn't want to do it. So I picked a super high number. And then, uh, which was $6,000 at the time. And uh, the guy said yes. And I was like, oh. and I remember the moment being like, holy sh what mm. just happened? And I had seven more calls a day. And like that day, I made like $60,000. And I had just been, un like the story I was telling, let's go full circle. Like I'd just been completely broken. Like in that moment, like gym launch hadn't been created yet. There wasn't, you know, all these other things. But in that moment, I was like, what if this keeps happening? Like, are we out of it? Like did, or like, did we finally, is this the one thing that's finally gonna get me out of like failure after failure after mm -hmm. failure after failure? And so it's just like, at, what, is the, what is the event that gives you the biggest predictor of the future success? So like there's micro wins of like, hey, the funnel's working, I've got leads. And then you have like a day of huge sales. You're like, what if this happened every day? And then maybe you exit Quest and you're like, what if I exit five more times? You know what I mean? Mm. Like, so anyways, I was just, that was really cool for me just even thinking through like those, those, those snapshots of moments. And rule number 10, the last one before some very special bonus clips is be a real winner. The idea that we're gonna somehow, like, because the desire for legacy is the desire to cheat death. Like that's what it stems from. It's like, we don't want to die. We want to last forever. And so we want to make something that is impermanent. And so we fool ourselves into thinking that the accolades and the material success and the books we write, whatever, are going to last forever. And they're probably not, right? And so like, I mean, the sun's going to disappear at some point, right? So like, right, right. So like if we don't do anything before then, like at the very least that's going to happen. And so if that is the inevitable outcome, I think it shifts the way people think. And I think that's when you start changing. I mean, Tony Robbins talks about like global, global belief systems. And that's why if someone like adopts a new religious belief, like everything changes because the reasons they do and the way they believe the world works changes. And so I think that if they did do a hundred percent death tax, it would be a really interesting way to see the downstream effects of how it would change the, the way the players played the game. What do you think would happen if all the billionaires started distributing their wealth sooner? I think what would happen or, or would is, they be as hungry to be and driven to push and build and innovate? Yes to generate the wealth if yeah. they knew, oh, I gotta give this away anyways quickly. I think they would. Why? I think it's because it's, I think it's, I think, I'm gonna say something that may sound bad, but um, I think winners win because of who they are. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's like sales guys, like you can have an incentive or a comp plan. They just wanna win. But they are salespeople. And if I get on the phone, I want to sell because of who I am, not because of the comp. The comp is the ticket to get me to say yes to the deal, but it will not change my activity. I will do it because I love to sell. Right, and so I think billionaires get there because they love the game. Like you don't get to a billion without just because you obviously don't need it for you. You stopped yeah. needing it for you millions and millions ago, right? And so you do it just because you love the game. What I do think, and the reason that I, I like that solution is because uh, Elon Musk said this, but uh, private enterprise is ten times as efficient at capital allocation compared to the government. Right. So every dollar that private private enterprise spends, it's ten times more efficient, and so. The idea is like if, if we were to death tax 100%, so whatever you accumulate while you're alive, it just goes back. Like, and the thing is, is, it's not that it would go back into the system through the government. It would if you were lazy. But most people, knowing the government was going to take it, the less efficient vehicle at the end of your life, you would then start thinking about how can I allocate this money efficiently? And so what I think what would happen is you'd create far more ingenuity and innovation around social enterprise um, before they die, solving problems, knowing yeah. that the wealth would eventually disappear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, like, it's more there's this backstop that no one wants to hit, and so I think what happened is they would change their behavior before hitting the backstop. I don't think sure. a lot of people would just be dumping their billion to the government. I think just knowing that they had to <laughs> would then just trigger them to yeah, yeah. That would be you know that's Alex's two cents of the world, which is obviously different. 
there was a, a tweet by Layla, my wife. She said, like, stop listening to people about like, sorry, stop listening to people about how to play the game who've never been anywhere but the sidelines. And the problem is too many of the people who are watching this right now, y'all are on the sidelines and have always been on the sidelines and are trying to pick a niche to get into to sell how to do the niche. Well, that's dumb. You've never done it. So a lot of times people are trying to skip to a higher leverage opportunity without having done the requisite work of understanding the niche, which is why the Y Combinator people look for, like if you wanna make a software in the payment space, we'd love to see that you have experience in the payment space because there's so much stuff that you don't know that you know when you actually spend three, five you know, years doing something in an industry. You understand the lingo, you understand the avatar, you understand the problems and you can see See opportunities if you have an entrepreneurial hat on. There's always problems in every industry, which means there's always opportunity. And fundamentally, business is just solving problems that exist with a and making sure the math makes sense. Like that's literally it. It's like, where is there a problem? How much do they think this is a problem? And is there a way that I can solve it and charge for it? That's it. Like that's really all the business is. And really how well you solve the problem is going to dictate how much virality your business has, because if you solve it really well, people will tell people and your, your business will grow, right? I think the problem that a lot of people have is they didn't know how to make an offer, right? It's the fundamental thing that is the beginning of building a business is you got to know what you're selling. And so that was a problem for a lot of people. And then people got that problem solved. And then they told their friends and the books sold hundred thousand copies in six months with no promotion. And so I'm only, I'm sharing this because I couldn't write a book on offers without having made a ton of offers. And I feel like there's too often people who are trying to focus on a niche who've never actually done the thing in the niche. And this is really, really rampant in the internet space because everyone's trying to take a shortcut to get there when they realize, like when I'm telling you right now, you're never going to get there because you're not good enough. Like you're never going to get there because you're not good enough. You have to do the Rocky cutscene. You have to eat the for a period of time so that you can get the reps in, so you can put your time into the bar in, so that you can actually get good. And before you are good, you will suck. And you have to accept a long period of sucking and you do enough volume that eventually you'll suck so little that you'll actually be good. And then, then at that point, then you'll actually have a real decision to make, which is I'm actually really good at this thing now that I've learned. Do I want to teach it to other people or just want to do more of the thing that I'm doing, right? Because like a realtor can then just grow a team of a hundred realtors and own the entire thing, which is what I'd recommend this guy do, right? Rather than have an agency um, that does it, right? And so this is kind of where where I think the problem is, is that like I had another question that was sent to me on Instagram, which is like, hey, how do I soft turn? Because a lot of my a lot of my clients aren't getting results. And I'm like, well, duh. He's like, he, no, he said, he said, how do I sell from 10,000 to 100,000 a month when I don't have a lot of testimonials? And I was like, you're not good at the thing that you're supposed to be good at. It's why you don't have testimonials. It's why you're not going to $100,000 a month. Like he's making the goal $100,000 a month rather than being good. I, 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 I have no words. I have no words. I don't get it. You know what I mean? Like everyone's in such a rush that you will never get there. It is the slowest path to getting there is to fool yourself into thinking that you're good at something that you're not. You have to go and pull the thread and say, which, and the thing is, is like, well, do what you're passionate about. Whatever. You're not going to be passionate about stuff that you suck at. What you have to do is like, which of these opportunities seem like they have potentially have high leverage and I'm going to learn from the bottom, right? It's like one of the best ways to learn stuff is starting at the bottom, not because, because it's the only option, but because if you understand the entire pathway of, of a client journey or of an industry journey, then you will have more trench knowledge, more depth of experience that you will be then able to apply. People see my, you know, videos on personal finance. People see videos of mine on sales. People see videos on mine recruiting. People see videos of mine of marketing. And it's like, how did you acquire all these skills? It's because like it's not like because I tried to jump to the spot that I'm at. You, you can't skip. Like there's a sequence. Buildings are built with foundations, and your career is a pyramid, and the peak of that pyramid is based on the depth of the foundation that you build. And so, like I've said this before, and I'll say it again, but your work works on you more than you work on it. And so, even though you might not be getting paid in the period that you're at, just because you're struggling doesn't mean you're failing. And it means, and the thing is, as long as you're getting better, you're making progress and the progress is the success, is that you are getting better. And like, you will turn the corner. Like that's an inevitability if you put enough time in. You are not successful in my eyes because whenever you see some outcome, you stop the activities, which means you don't have the trait of consistency. And I was like, the reason you aren't where you want to be is because you can't do things repeatedly. And so most people can't do one thing over and over again. You need to be able to do the doing without seeing the result of your doing. And you have to keep doing it. And if you can keep doing things independent, and this is both ways, if it goes really well, you keep doing the thing that got you there. And if it's not going well, comma, yet, you keep doing the thing so that you get good enough that one day it will. And that's the shift that most people don't make. And I think that's why most people just stay poor. And the reality is that if you can commit to the actions and the behaviors and the traits that you will grow through doing, then at the end of this process, a decade later, you will be the type of person who can do something for a long period of time and wait. And I promise you that if you have that trait, money will never be a constraint in your life. And this is from Atomic Habits. Every winner and every loser have the same goals. 
So when you measure yourself by having this external thing and people are like, set goals, everyone wants to be rich. Everyone wants to have a six pack. Your goals don't make you unique. It's the activities that you do that make you unique. The goal of the winner is to commit to the activities. The goal of the loser is to commit to the goal. 52% of 18 year olds, high school seniors, think they're gonna be millionaires by 25. The world is going to be shook. Many of you will fail. And that's because most of you have the same goal. 52% you think you're gonna be a millionaire, right? That's just the math. But only a small percentage will because if you wanna be a millionaire, you're not gonna focus on making the million dollars. You're gonna focus on the stuff that makes a million dollars. And so when you can divorce the activities from the outcome, then you can focus on the doing, which whether your income does this over that period of time, your self-esteem remains the same because you're committing to what you can control. If you can make that shift, it will change your life. So I started making podcasts six years ago. I committed to that process. When I signed on with a, a YouTube vendor a few years ago, on the first call I said, I'd like to have this channel be something in five to 10 years. I was like, We'll look at it then and see if it was worth continuing to do. I was like, but I'm in for a decade. And he stopped me afterwards. He was like, I've literally never had a client say that to me, ever. He's like, they're all like, how can I get leads in the first 90 days from YouTube? And like, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, if we're making progress, I'm good. I will commit to that. I think that if you can think that way, you will get what you want. And then people will ask you a decade from now, man, how did you have this overnight success and blah, 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 blah. And aren't you like, don't the followers and the fans like, how does it not get to your head? And you're like, because it was never the goal. And so I feel just as good at year one as I do at year eight, because the activities that I committed to remain the same. If you can think that way and you can shift your perspective, it will, it'll decrease your emotional ups and downs. And I think we all need ways to decrease our emotional ups and downs in the game of business because like we need to have second lives and third lives and fourth lives. And the way to do that is to not put your life, your game playing life in something that you can't control, but putting all your game playing life in the things you can. I think the single greatest differentiator between the poor and the middle class, middle class and rich, rich and the truly wealthy is how they see time. And if you think about money as simply a condensed unit of time, right? That's all money is like you trade it for time. I mean, you can trade time for money. So like it is, they're almost equivalent units. And the people who know how to master their time the most mean that they know how to master their money the most. Right. And so really, if you want to master to the original question of like, how do wealthy people become wealthy is because they master their time. And so time horizon is just like the perspective from which we see what we want to achieve. And so if I am doing, if I'm building a company from the place of like, I believe that this company should exist. I believe this problem is worth solving. And that is where you start it from. Then you build it differently. Versus, and, versus, versus I need to make money. I need to make money this week. I need to make money tomorrow because. What can like, I go make money with? Exactly. Yeah. And so I think like, I mean, you've built this amazing brand here. If, if people were able to not ask for 12 months, and just serve. I wanted to give you the simplest single hack that I have used inadvertently and seen a tremendous amount of success. That is asking myself the question, what would a person who does this type of thing do in this instance? The, the one that I'll tell you that I've repeated a lot to myself over the years, probably over the last five or 10 years, has been the repeated chorus of, what would a wise man do? I think it's because I did not consider myself to be very wise and I acted many ways that were unwise um, earlier on in my life and I still continue to do so, um, but I try to do less of it, right? And I think that, and I'll, I'll borrow this again from James Clear's book, your identity is much more of a weighing system. Actually, this is not from his book, but like I th it's much more of a voting system where you, you cast votes in either direction based on your activities of what type of person you want to become. And I think the simplest distillation of that concept is simply asking the question, what would this type of person do? If you can use that as the refrain that you come back to over and over again, the chorus of your day that gets repeated over and over again, I think it's much easier than trying to remember the 50 point checklist of all the activities that you need to do to achieve the goal. And the, the friend that came back in my life um, where we were having this conversation, I just distilled it down to like, what would a billionaire do? And so when we're confronted with these crossroads, right, you wake up in the morning and you're like, I don't know what I should start. It's like, what would a billionaire do? And so basically what you can do is have a certain refrain or chorus that you ask yourself, what would this type of person do? And that type of person, when you ask that question, is who you will eventually become as you continue to cast votes that reinforce the stories that we tell ourselves about who we are. And those are the things that create long lasting, deep change. And what's more about this is that these 
changes, when they become internal, when they become ingrained in our behavior, they become effortless, but it takes time. And so I think that the mental cue that I have given myself inadvertently over the years, I don't have a lot of choruses that I refrain to or that I come back to over and over again. And so I tweeted about one and it got shared a zillion times, but it is, what would someone 10 times smarter than me do in this situation, right? And a different way of saying that is what would a billionaire do? And, and word it in whatever way that resonates with you. But I think rather than having that big checklist, you can put just a little post-it on your computer or wherever you work that's a reminder to yourself that this is the type of person I want to become. And in order to become this type of person, I need to do these things because those actions will reinforce the thoughts that I say about myself. Because the whole concept behind affirmations that I do not like, right, which is I am a, you know, I'm a lion, I'm a tiger, I'm a whatever, right? Just saying them doesn't make them true unless you're a crazy person. And most of us are not crazy, I think, right? There's plenty of crazy, but don't get me wrong. But if you're probably watching this channel, you're probably at least semi-sane, right? If we have, you know, this degree of sanity that's on our side, then what we have to do is create something else which is evidence. We have to give ourselves evidence that we are this type of person in order to become that. But how do you have evidence that you are gonna be this person when you, when you have none? Well, it starts with activity. It starts with doing the stuff. And as an added corollary, depending on the goal that you have, it might be what would a person with a six pack do? What would a pro champion bodybuilder do? What would an amazing husband do? Or what would the best husband in the world do? And so you can use this framework of asking the question of what your ideal self would do in any given circumstance to apply to a vast number of scenarios. So rather than trying to fix for the habit, fix for the being, and then the habits will take care of themselves in accordance with the type of person that you have stated you wish to become. And so then the goals we have become becoming the person we want to be. Once we know who we want to become, then that can direct the types of activities that will be in accordance with that. And the reason I like this better too, is that if we're trying to reinforce an identity or an identity trait about ourselves, this is a really good habit, I think, that I've picked up over the years. Our minds are meaning-making machines. And so what that means is we determine what is meaningful and what is not. And then we ascribe labels to them in terms of positive and negative because that is how we survive. Now, that being said, our brains are meant to keep us alive, not meant to help us thrive, right? To use a rhyming word for you. Now, that being said, with this whole concept around labeling, it's something that I'm probably most passionate about, like the concept of labeling as a whole. It's unbelievably powerful when it comes to persuading people to do things, unbelievably powerful when it comes to changing people's worldviews and their perspectives on life. And I will share a few of those examples with you. So I'll give you a quick persuasion example for how powerful this is. If I wanted to persuade someone to do something, then what I would do is I would create a positive label that I would associate them with. So I would say, you are probably a loving and caring man for or, you know, you want to provide support for your family. Is that true? They're like, yes. And I'm like, yeah, you definitely seem like one of those types of people. And since you are one of those types of people, I think that you should invest in this program that we have because that would be in alignment with this ideal that we just labeled the person with. And so what happens is it creates cognitive dissonance because for the person, in order for them to stay in accordance with the label that they would like to have, they then feel obligated to then act in accordance with that label that we just uh, prescribed. Now, that's a very simplistic example. You can weave that into narratives and sales scripts so that people become psychologically labeled and then want to act in accordance with that label because they see it as positive, right? The thing is, is that it can also work in reverse in terms of how you can harm someone. And the reason that this is so viscerally upsetting to me is that I have had members of my family extended and whatnot who have, I would say, debilitated themselves in large part because of what they believe to be mental illness and I disagree. Now, many people will get triggered at this and so I will say my big disclaimer, which is this is not financial advice, this is not grammatical advice, this is not spiritual advice, this is not even advice. This is a guy making a YouTube video about stuff that pisses me off and hopefully some of the things that serve me well. Now, let's talk about the labels that are negative. One of the things, one of the most pernicious acts that exists, negative, bad stuff, is when we take the human experience that has ups and downs, that has extremes, that exists on continuums, and we label one side of the continuum as bad and the other side of the continuum as good. For example, happy, sad, energized, or weak, tired, right? We have equal opposites, you know, relaxed, stressed, right? There's lots of examples of these. The reason that this is so dangerous when we give a positive or negative label is that people think that they have a problem when they are not feeling happy or energized or relaxed or clear-minded versus foggy, you know what I mean, whatever. And the thing is, is in order for there to be light, there must be darkness. 
Think about that for a second. In order for there to be good, there must also be bad. One, if you want to admit the existence of one, there must also be the existence of the other. Right, awesome. Now, the problem, this is why we have to be careful with labels, that most people suffer from, is that they label normal variations in the human condition with negative experiences. And so they see themselves as tired and say, this is bad. Whereas it's really just part of the human condition. They see themselves as sad, rather than happy and see that as bad. And so what happens is you start to upgrade a finite emotional condition into a long-standing emotional disturbance because you think it's a problem. And the thing is, is it's very easy to sell people on why these things are, are problems. Big Pharma is, is the king of this. Are you feeling tired, stressed? You know, are you hungry? Are you horny? Well, you are suffering from being a human being. It's being human. And so I think a lot of this, and the reason that it wraps into the original part of the prompt of this video, is that if we want to be enduring entrepreneurs, we want to be people who have resilience, we want to be people who have mental fortitude, we must be careful about the things that we label. And there's also the good bad label, which is the simplest label that a lot of people ascribe to conditions that are, that are uh, ephemeral, right? They're, they're brief, right? And then they change. But there's also the shoulds have must need to, et cetera, that we say in our lives that we have to do these things, or we must do these things. And if we do not, or else, we put out a threat towards the universe. If I don't get my coffee, I must get my coffee, I need to have coffee before I start my day. What happens is that we create these implied threats to ourselves and the universe. If we don't, then what? To get started, you have to sell something to someone. That's it. Like, literally, that's all. One avatar, one product, one channel. That's it. So you have one way of getting customers. You sell one thing to one specific type of person. That is all you need to do to get to six figures. To get to seven figures, you need to learn how to do those three things, comma, reliably, comma, consistently, right? So it's, you know how to sell one product to one avatar on one channel in a consistent manner. So you start having predictive metrics on how you can acquire customers. So it's either I spend this amount of money on advertising and this is how many you know calls I get booked. And then from that many calls, I get that many you know sales, et cetera. Uh, if it's outbound, it's like I send this many emails or make this many calls or this many texts and then this many you know reply back, this many schedule, this many show, this many close, et cetera. If you're running organic, it's I know that I need to have this many posts that I have to make across these different channels with call to actions that drive towards this page. For every thousand visitors on this page, I get why opt-ins, you know what I mean? So each of these vehicles or I have to hit my email list, you know, once a week. And if I hit it once a week with a call to action again, so all these are the different ways you can get customers. You could also do affiliates. You can do referrals. There's many ways to do it. But the point is, is you pick one avatar, one channel and one product. And then as soon as you can start predictively, uh, as soon as you can start predicting how many inputs it takes to get an output, then you get to a million, right? And at that point you're, you know, at one, two, three million ish a year. Uh, one to three, you have to build out your core team. So that's usually like the first five hires, first five to 10 ish that are, it depends on the, on the, on the ticket of the thing that's being sold. You know, if you're selling $25,000 things versus $500 things, the, the, the team size is going to be different, but it's the core team at, at about 3 million. And that's usually, that's the reason that we take companies on at three is usually there because, because there's a core team and at 3 million, there's product market fit. So they've demonstrated that people want this thing and they have enough support that we can take them from three to 10. Three to 10, uh, and this is interesting because this is a mistake a lot of people make at three, and I can stop whenever you want me to cut the lines of, of the problems that, that come up, but the problems that come up at three-ish um, are that people start getting cute, right? And they start saying, oh, and here's what's difficult is that you get reinforced on the fact that the more you market, the more you sell, the more money you make, right? And it's true. And you can scale from there by doing more sales and more marketing. And that is what the vast majority of the industry will do because they got reinforced doing it early. The problem is that they switch the objectives. The objective of the first phase of business, which for me is like zero to three, is just to demonstrate product market fit and an acquisition channel that is profitable. That is the objective. Now, at, at this point, we transition objectives to increasing lifetime value per customer. So this is improving the customer experience, putting data tracking in place. Um, if there's an ascension opportunity, that makes sense. We need to build out that product or service line so that, and this is the big point, 
so that when we do choose to add another channel or expand on our current channel, we can do so more profitably, right? Where if you just sell a single product that might not have as much LTV as you would, you know, you would want, uh, as you scale or put more in, uh, your margins begin to compress. So you might go up to 10 million, but your margins have compressed over time. And then you get in this place where you have to keep selling to maintain your overhead, but you're not really taking enough home and you can't have enough cash, free cash flow to grow the business. And so sometimes it's like you have to take the step back fix the product, fix the customer experience, fix, fix the, the service, fix the data, fix the infrastructure that everything's built on, probably hire and fire some people that you promoted a little bit too early that didn't have the experience because they're actually not actually running things that well. Um, and then once we fix that stuff, then honestly, going from three to 10 usually almost happens on its own. Once we're at 10, then we go far more aggressively on the acquisition side, which is you know the, the easiest moniker that I use is more, better, new. So we do more of what we're currently doing until we max that out. And then we do better of what we're currently doing. Is there any CRO opportunity? So conversion rate optimization, can we switch this headline out? Can we change this lead magnet? Can we, can we implement some of the best practices that we know to get you know, more people to show up if it's a service business, if it's a, if it's a products business? Now, I only focus on service businesses, so lots of, me, lots of our stuff is over the phone. Um, can we change the, the video sales letters and the follow-up emails, things like that? All the improvements that can happen. Um, and then different is, okay, or new is, can we add a new channel to this? So we have six that we can choose from to get new customers. We've got, we've got, we can hit up our own lists. We can do cold, cold outbound. We can do content. We can do paid ads. We can do affiliates and we can do referrals. And so those are the only six ways to get new customers. We look at those six and say, of the skills that we currently have, which of these would make the most sense to add to it? And you can even go adding a new thing within a current. So if you're running paid ads, it's like going from Facebook to YouTube or going from Facebook to TikTok. And so there's, you know, each, each one of those six squares has, channels or media channels that you can, or platforms that you can tap into that give you new audiences. So that was a little bit of a crash course there, but that's what allows you to scale from 10 to 30 and beyond. Um, at 30 ish, the, uh, the founders typically will start feeling constrained because they are the juju behind the entire business. I say this because all of us, right? I do this. I do this all the time, right? And this is going to be a repeated theme because it needs to be repeated, right? We need to be reminded more than we need to be taught. That is a, a saying that we have in my world, and I will, I will pass it on to you guys, Mosey Nation. We need to be reminded more than we need to be taught. Do the boring work, repeat successful actions. And so if he's gotten to this point, or if you've gotten to a point in your business and it has plateaued, the question is, has it plateaued because this is true, like I have, the only reason a business should plateau that is reasonable, that is not your fault, is that you have reached the total addressable market, as in you have saturated the total, the total market of that thing. So for example, if you were selling dog food and every dog within this, you know, maybe you sell a specific type of niche of poodle food, right? You've gotten, you know, 70% of poodle owners to buy your food and you can't grow any more beyond that, right? Well, that would be reasonable, but then you'd obviously just do a different type of dog, right? You'd, you'd hop verticals, right? So there's not even a reason, but it would be the only potentially rational reason um, would be uh, that your market uh, has changed. So a different example is a friend of mine owns uh, a company that does uh, newspaper advertising. All right, so they actually help newspapers translate their advertisements into uh, digital products, which is pretty cool. So they are able to sell a whole, like basically a whole new ad product to small businesses um, who want to buy ads, right? Which is, by the way, how newspapers make money. He could not grow his business because newspapers have shrunk by 25% year over year, which is 25% compounding the wrong direction. And he's been in that business for like 10 years. So now the, the market size is like literally like 5% of what it used to be to 10 years ago. And so as a result of that, he was growing at an inverse rate to the shrinkage of the industry, right? And so he got to a point where he couldn't grow any more than just basically servicing the ones that are still alive. And then as they fell, so did his business, right? And so that is the only logical reason that a business can plateau that is not in your control. And unless you're selling to newspapers, which you're probably not, the reason is much simpler, which is you just don't know how. And I'll tell you a different story that I had, and then I'll, 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 I'll wrap this up at the end. So I was having a different conversation with a woman who was doing, I think, $4 million a year. And she was selling uh, info products that were weight loss, so like weight loss info products, so like programs and eBooks and things like that, which is cool, right? She's a big following, all that kind of stuff. And we got, I, I, went, I did a podcast with her and, uh, after we got off the podcast, she was like, yeah, so these are my plans. I'm going to be doing uh, like a, an apparel line and a supplement line and a cream line and a whatever, right? And I just kind of sat there and I was like, well, I think that's a terrible idea. She was like, she just looked at me across there. She's like, what? And I was like, yeah, I think it's a terrible idea. And she was like, oh. And I was like, why don't you just take the thing that's making you $4 million and make it 
make you $10 million? Why don't you do that? And the, and the answer is the same as the first answer. I just don't know how. And I was like, right, well, why don't we solve that problem and then not create a new business? Why don't we just put all of our effort in solving that problem? And so I'm a big believer, and this is the, the, the piece that I want to share with you, Mosey Nation, is that I'm a big believer in the theory of constraints, which means that a system will grow until it is constrained, right? It has a constraint, and then once you remove the constraint, it'll continue to grow, right? Until it reaches another constraint. And so most people are always curious, or many people ask me, hey, Alex, how did you achieve, quote, so much in, quote, such little time or at such a young age? And I say all that in quotes because so much could be and young age, whatever. But I'm saying, I'm just, I'm paraphrasing, all right? And I think that um, one of the things that we have done well is prioritizing what problems to solve. And that is understanding the prioritization of problems and realizing that there is really only typically one or two things that are constraining our growth. And by definition, there'd really only be one thing that's the constraint until we reach another thing that might be beginning to constrain us, but isn't the true constraint yet. I think that when I started out in business, I heard all these things in the personal development space, like, ah, oh, you should have, you should read these affirmations every morning. I never did that. And it was because it felt stupid to me. Now, that being said, there might be some people who've had life-changing results from doing that. But what I did notice is that the stories I would tell myself about myself were the things that changed my beliefs. They were the things that changed my character. And so a lot of times in some of my other videos, I've talked about how entrepreneurship is about three things. It's about changing the beliefs that you have. It's about increasing the skill set that you have and then the character traits that go along with that to make sure the skills are successful. So I'll give you a simple example for this. So a friend of mine, he started a fitness app. It was doing about $20,000 a month. He was a CrossFit Games competitor, um, but he was really ashamed because he wasn't the winner. He was like, you know, a really, really highly ranked one, but he wasn't the winner. And so he believed that his app wasn't good enough uh, and so he never promoted it. So it grew to $20,000 a month in revenue with him doing zero promotion. And when he realized that it was okay for him to promote it and people got a lot of value from it and the app was good enough. He went from $20,000 a month to like $150,000 a month, like that. And the difference was his beliefs. His skills were the same, his character traits were the same, he changed his beliefs. So let me give you a different example. When I actually started out getting in my own business, I had a chain of gyms, you know, this is 10 years ago, I had a chain of gyms. I knew how to run sales teams, I knew how to generate leads, I knew how to do all these things. But what ended up happening was I had one missing piece, which was also a belief. Darn, I was actually trying to give you a different one. But I had a mentor come in and say, you need to get in the licensing business, you need to license this model lots of people rather than doing the actual model yourself. And so I did make that transition. And then we went from two or $3 million to doing seven. And the next year we did 28 million. So the year that we made the transition halfway through is what jumped us from two or three to seven. And it was just in the last like four months that we saw this crazy growth. And then we did 28 million the next year. And so it was because I had all these skills and I also had the character traits. I just needed again to change my the beliefs. I was trying to give you an example with the character traits. I'll, I'll, let me think of one. So if you have, uh, for example, if I had had those skills, but I didn't have the character traits of being disciplined and being focused on one thing, I would have jumped uh, between multiple you know, entrepreneurial endeavors and never been able to see success because even though I had the beliefs about what was possible, um, like if I had said, okay, I'm going to do gyms and I'm going to do chiropractors and I'm going to do dentists, and I'm going to do X, Y, and Z, right? Until I had the character trait of focus, the character trait of discipline, um, then I would not have seen the success, right? And so the next natural question is, okay, well, if I have to have aligned beliefs, skills, and character traits at each level of the ladder, because you can have, and this is what's crazy. When you see the overnight successes, this is what happens. I want to describe it to you so you understand it and how you can do it. So let's say that there's a ladder, all right? And you've got this pole on one side, you've got the pole on the other side, and you've got the middle bar, okay? You need all three to move to the next level of the ladder, right? And so, for example, you might have the left side built up six stories above where you're at, and you might have uh, the right side build up six stories, you know, uh, or you know, ten stories from where you're at right now. But all of a sudden, if you change your character and that character trait development gives you three more rungs, all of a sudden you go three rungs because you already have the constraint has been removed. And so you can be more advanced in your beliefs than you are in your skills, or you can be more advanced in your character trait than you are in your skills, or you can be more advanced in your skills than you are in your beliefs, right? And so it's having all three of those that are checked off at each level of entrepreneurship that gets you to one, $1 million a year, $3 million a year, $10 million a year, $100 million a year, whatever it is, right? Is you have to have all of them. And so what I, the, the point of this video and I'm gonna, is, is to get you to understand how to actually develop those soft things because the skills are straightforward, right? The skills are you just go buy the course and you read the book and you consume the content like this and you practice, you apply, right? That's what you have to do. That's it, That's it, right? Um, one of the skills that I see lots of marketers these days not have is they don't know how to sell. They don't know how to develop a sales team. They don't know how to manage and grow a sales team. They don't want to lead a sales team. That's a skill they don't have. And as soon as they do, they go from 3 million to 10 million like that very, very easily, right? 
It's understanding that that's the skill deficit and as soon as they do it, boom, they blow up. I was fortunate because I had a ton of the skills in my skill toolbox, but I went from making nothing to tons because I had all of these rungs of this ladder already built out to, to a $30 million level, except I just didn't have the beliefs. That was my issue. Candidly, I suffer from a lot of insecurities. And so my wife was the one who was like, you can do this. Like you don't have to have these gyms. Like you can license out the model. Like you can, you can really succeed like this. And I honestly just thought she was a really smart person and very wise. And so I trusted her belief in me before I really trusted it for myself. And so hopefully you can have somebody like that in your life, but maybe that, that can be me. I trust in your, I trust in your, your skills and your beliefs. So, so hopefully you can borrow some of that trust. Cause I promise you the world does get better when you, when you take those leaps of faith. How do we behave? The reason that this is so important is that it's one thing to know where you're going, but it's another thing to know how you're going to get there. And so this is just as true in business partnerships and marriage in terms of what you want uh, to have happen and how you want to get there um, as it is in business, okay? And so what I wanna do is actually just walk you through the three values that we have at acquisition.com and why we believe them. And so from an overarching perspective, the way to come to values um, is to look at what are the non-negotiables, okay? And so what I mean by that is, and, and every company is different because the core thing about values is that they have to be things that are true and innate to you, right? Like for example, at Southwest, uh, have fun is one of their core values. And if someone does not want to have fun or does not believe in the processes that they do to have a good time, then that is a non-negotiable for them. That person cannot work at that company. It is a fireable offense. And so these are not aspirational. These are not things that you would like to have. These are things that are core to who you are as a person and as a team. All right. And so when you decide on these non-negotiables, they are by their very nature non-negotiable, which means that you hire based on these, you fire based on these. And these are the core spirit of the team. And some of the mistakes that I see when people make values is that one, they don't draw the line in the sand. And so one of the core things about a value is that it has to, you have to be able to say, this is not this, right? You have to be able to say, okay, between justice and mercy, we lean towards justice or we lean towards mercy, which means you have to repel people with your values. All right. And so if your values do not repel people, then they are not values. They are platitudes. Okay. And so it's very important. The next thing is that when you're making your values, the values themselves need to be ideally said in words that you would normally say. So if you have little sayings inside of your community, then then a lot of times those can become some of the values you have. So for example, at Gym Launch, one of our first portfolio companies, uh, speed is king, do the boring work. These were different ways. I mean, we could just say work ethic, but that's not the way we would have said it. We could have said be fast or fast turnaround times, but speed is king was the way we would have said it, okay? And so some of the things that I've learned with this is also, you cannot have too many values as in, I'll say it differently. You can have too many values. You have to be very selective at the, the true core values of the company. All right. And so if you're, you know, between two, a lot of times you just have to chunk up uh, and kind of get a broader value, but they become the core. And I think that what we have found is that three is the sweet spot. And that number has continued to distill down over time. But I think three is the amount that your human brain can comprehend as lenses to make a decision, right? And the reason these values are so important is that when you scale the company, you have to scale decision making, which means Means you have to scale the frame with which you duplicate the decision making process, which is should I hire this person, even though Alex is not involved in this, do they align with the core values? And the more stringent the values, the easier it is to have a black and white example of, I think this person meets two out of the three or one out of three, but we only accept three out of three. And I will tell you this as an additional point, if you have core values in the business, I would relay them to all aspects of your life. If you would not do business with someone for a, a decade, do not do business with them for a day. It's one of the Navalisms that I like a lot. And so if you wouldn't, if you don't want to deal with this client for a decade, don't deal with them for a day. If you wouldn't deal with this employee for a decade, don't deal with them for a day. You have to, and, and the extent to which you hold your line of intolerance around these truly non-negotiables will dictate the health of the organization. And if you make these non-negotiables and realize that there are people in your organization in your client base that do not ascribe to these, then you must make the changes to fix it. And that is the pruning of the tree that will ultimately grow the tree, all right? These are the short-term pains for the long-term gains. What it was, was setting the tone. And the reason that my views on business have dramatically shifted is that I have always had a tendency to lean towards strategy, acquisition, monetization, pricing structures, and all of that stuff is important. But I think within a business, 
there are two components to it. You've got the smarts and you've got the hearts and you have to have both. And I think that most people overestimate the importance of smarts, myself included. And I think that there's a lot to do with the hearts because business strategy overarchingly is not that complex. But like you really think about it, right? It's like, you gotta find something that's good that people want and you sell it for a lot more than it costs you to do it. And you do as much of that as you possibly can. Like that's kind of the idea, right? And the thing is, is it gets lost in the execution. It gets lost in the doing, right? As soon as you hire your first employees, you're like, no, employees can't, employees can't do what I can do. It's like, well, that's a horrible belief. You should probably change that before you try and move forward. That's a limiting belief, right? If you want to have a big business. And so when I think about this from a cultural standpoint, and this is what has shifted for me, is that it's become so much more about the soft skills. It's so much more about coaching and developing the leaders of the company. It's, it's so much more about addressing behavioral dynamics of someone that are limiting them more so than it is about tinkering. And I can't help but think that so many entrepreneurs, myself included, I spent so much time tinkering and, and, and tweaking things. What if we change this in our sales process? What if we change this on this page? What if we change the offer like this? What if we change this on the price? What if we change the, the, the payment terms? Blah, 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 all these different things, right? And think about this for a second for yourself. How many things have you tinkered with in your business over the last however many years, how many months, and your business hasn't changed at all, right? Because the real problem is not the strategy. The problem is not the smarts, right? The problem is the heart, right? The people are not doing what you want them to do because they don't understand why they need to do it and why it's important, right? And that's the soft stuff. And you've got, you know, people who don't want to talk to each other because they don't like each other because one guy's really annoying. And so it's like, it would be, it would better serve you to fix that problem than to try and come up with some new strategy, right? Realizing that has been one of the biggest breakthroughs that I've had in my career. Those two stories should illustrate the difference between um, having a championship mentality um, and having a loser mentality and what might be going on in your business. And I'll leave you with one more story really quickly. So if any of you has ever been on a championship team, right? If you've ever played in a sports uh, arena or whatever, and you've been on a winning team, you've been on a losing team, right? And you've probably been on a losing team that had a lot of good players, but you guys were not connected. You weren't concerted. You weren't aligned, right? On the flip side, you had a winning team and it was like, everyone showed up to practice. Everyone, you know, tried their hardest. It was the effort and the consistency and the alignment of the team that accomplished the goal. The rules are the same. Everyone was trying to do the exact same thing. And so when you think about the entire business landscape, right? Your competitors have access more or less to the same talent pool that you do. They can see what your strategy is overall, and most people are not that dumb, right? And so as long as you have a relatively sound strategy, like you're not selling things at a loss, right? Then the difference between the two is going to be your ability to execute and have people execute on your behalf. And so that's going to become, down, like for us as CEOs, we do shift towards becoming championship team coaches, which is why John Wooden, if he had run a business, would have had a championship business because he focused on the fundamentals. And one of my favorite sayings of all time is, advanced people never don't do the basics. Advanced people, Never don't do the basics. I would go to I would go to these stages and I would watch guys get on stage and they'd say, you know, we we follow up with all of our leads, you know, within five minutes. You know, when we get on sales calls, we always ask them why they're there. We label them a problem. You know, we overview some of the past things they've done and then they fo they follow a clear framework. And then as soon as someone buys, we you know we have a good onboarding process and nothing they say is revolutionary. It's just that they actually do it and the people are actually on their behalf. They're not the Vince, or don't have a manager like Vince, who's telling them they don't, that they shouldn't have to do that work, right? Who's sabotaging the business. What they did is they set the tone and then they carry the bar. And so their job is to be intolerant of anything but excellence and to reinforce that in the culture so that it's consistently executed across the company. Because that, between two companies, with the same strategy, will make the difference between somebody who, who yields disproportionate returns on advertising, crazy profits, good growth, great retention on employees, low turnover from a company that doesn't have that, right? Even though they both have the same strategy, or even if the smaller company has the better strategy, this guy will win. And this has been one of the most profound shifts that I've had. The biggest issue that most people have is they don't have the ability to discern what their missing link is or what their next step is. What's the, if you think about the theory of constraints, which is that a system will grow until it's constrained. And so what happens is most people add potential to a system, but they don't actually increase the throughput of the system. So for example, if I had a a bridge, right? And it has a weak link uh, in the bridge, or let's say a chain is probably simpler. So if you have a chain and you have to pull two things, the amount of force that you can put on the chain is just predicated based on the weakest link. And so what happens is that people reinforce a strong link and not the weak link in the chain. And so they add potential to the chain, but they don't actually add any more strength that can be pulled. And so if you think about the amount of money that you're trying to make as, a, as amount of money that you're literally trying to pull towards you, that weak link is going to be the skill deficiency that you have. And so most people solve problems that aren't really there. 
and they spend a lot of their time reinforcing skills that they enjoy, but that's not their deficiency. And so that's why like the entrepreneurship thing is you have to be a jack of all trades, master of none. You have to be good enough to get the thing across across the finish line to pull, you know, pull the money towards you. Uh, you don't have to have the strongest link. You just need all of the links to be strong enough. And so I think most people aren't good at assessing their own deficiencies. And so if the follow-up question is, how do you assess deficiencies? <laughs> right? How do you know what's, what's missing? The question is, uh, what are the revenue generating activities within a business? How can I get myself closer to those revenue generating activities? Um, and so you can look at product as a revenue generating activity. You can look at sales as a revenue generating activity. You can look at marketing as a revenue generating activity. And so if you think about those as kind of the three core pillars of what businessing is, and then you have back of house, right? You've got finance, you've got IT, you've got uh, the other pieces, but the people who ascend even in the back office know how to generate revenue uh, and bottom line for for their division. So for example, my CFO, uh, Suzanne Chiflett, she, um, you know, she led a $15 billion acquisition, uh, $5 billion, a $1 billion. The last company she was at was $750 million. She's been $1 to $100 million two times. So like, she's she's been there. And the first thing she did on our, like our first interview, she was like, oh, you won't have to pay for me. I was like, and she's paid very well. <laughs> um, and she's like, you don't have to pay for me. She's like, I'll save, I'll save more than what you're ever going to pay me. Just first six months, I'll save you that. And I was like, oh. Cool. And so smart people know how to do that. Like, like a, an intelligent, you know, video editor is going to come and say, dude, I can 10 X the amount of views that you're getting on this thing. Cause he's going to tie himself to marketing. A good product person is going to say, I can, imp- I can decrease our churn, which is going to increase your LTV. I'm going to be able to get more people to ascend because they can have a higher NPS score and they're more likely to want to keep buying from us. Like, so they have to just figure out a way to tie whatever the thing, if they're really passionate about something, by all means, go all in on it. If you're IT, then you're thinking, how can I decrease page load times? How can I get conversion rates up? You start getting into the CRO side. How can I organize the data in such a way that the CEO can make better decisions and we have real-time reporting against all the sales guys so we can optimize our funnels towards the best converting guys, right? Like, all of all aspects of the business can make more money, but people don't think about it through that lens. So the first thing is, how do I tie what I do every day to making more money in the business? You connect that dot and then you improve that connection. There are a lot of different things that come up in the business world where I will see people conflate or mistake what thing they are solving, right? And most times when I'm talking to a newer entrepreneur or even a more established entrepreneur and they reach out for help or guidance or whatever, right? Um, or it's one of our portfolio companies, most times they'll start talking, right, really fast about all this stuff to try and provide context. And I'll, I'll just usually pause them and be like, what problem are we solving? It usually gets them to stop, right? And I would, I would highly advise you, if you're, if you're dealing with, if you have subordinates or you have direct reports um, who roll into you and they have a whole bunch of decisions, a lot of times it can get caught, and sometimes ourselves too, we can get caught in the, in the day-to-day, the minutia, and just simply pause and say, what problem are we solving? There's so many pieces of this that I want to unpack that I think are going to be really interesting for you. But the first one is when you define what problems you are solving, you may even have to ask the question, is that a problem? When some people are like, well, hey, we're getting, you know, customer service complaints. It's like, okay, understood. Is this something that we believe that we can reasonably eliminate? Is this something that is catastrophic to the business or is this something that we can kind of try and improve over time, you know, through systems and process, right? And so a lot of times people misprioritize problems because they perceive them as as threats to existence when in reality they are a course of doing business and things that we can consistently improve, right? Especially if you're newer, you're starting out, of course, your product's not going to be perfect yet, right? You're just getting going. But you improve these things rather than thinking I have to stop everything to fix this problem, right? And so the first frame shift is that most people think in terms of like, I have a problem to solve rather than a dichotomy to be managed, as in these are two things that will always exist. All right, I'll give you a different example of this. Um, Actually, this will be a fun one. The reason we will probably never have people who are all happy about a tax code is because you cannot have both fairness and equality. Equality means everyone pays 10%. Fairness means the rich people pay more than the poor people. That's fair. This is equal. Both are ideals. And yet, somehow, they're not the same thing. And yet, both are right. And so because of that, we will always have this conflict. It's the same thing between justice and mercy. Both of them are ideals. Both of them are right. And yet, somehow, they're conflicting. And so we... We, we see these situations, and this is why I'm trying to hopefully give this to you, because the more I started to recognize these patterns, the more quickly I could recognize them and then identify them and then either dismiss them or say, oh, it's another one of those, right? It's a pattern recognition. It's like, oh, you guys are spending all this effort trying to solve a problem that is unsolvable. This is a dichotomy that must be managed and will never be eliminated. And so I think what it, my, my goal with this video is if I can help you get out of these little mental hamster wheels, uh, it's been incredibly valuable for me. 
All right. So that's the dichotomy. That's like one of the one of the things that people will mistake. They'll mistake a dichotomy for a problem that needs to be solved. All right. Another framework um, that that I find immensely valuable um, is the concept of, of of a continuum versus a binary. All right. This is probably one of the biggest mental errors that people make when they're trying to identify things. And this is what I mean by that. So, for example. I might say, uh, I'll use a weight loss example. So people will say something like, uh, I am off my diet or I'm on my diet, right? It's a very simple thing. And that's because psychologically we like to be binary. We like to label things as yes or no. But biology and reality exist on continuums, as in to what extent did you go off of your diet, right? Did you go 200 calories over? Did you go 500 calories over? And as even though it is quote more difficult to think in this way, it is also more accurate. And so our brain uses binaries as placeholders for decision making to store data, right? When in reality, when you start storing all these binary decisions, they start adding up and you start getting more and more inaccurate, if that's a word, on your decision making process because you're actually basing your decisions, not on facts, but based on binary shorthand that your brain saves. And so that is one of the biggest mistakes that I see all the time in thinking in entrepreneurs and really in anything in general, because we like to have that shorthand. It is easier, right? It's easier to say I fell off my diet or I am diabetic when the reality is it's not whether you are diabetic, it's how diabetic are you, right? Kind of interesting. I stole that from Dr. Cashy, but I just love that. Um, who's my closest friend? He's a biochemist, and we talk about this stuff all the time. Point being, if you can think about this within, um, I'll give you, I'll give you a, a business example. So if we have a um, a binary where people are saying yes or no, which is, let's say, Facebook doesn't work, marketing doesn't work. I hear these statements all the time, and you may laugh at this, right? But I get DMs like this all the time. Facebook doesn't work for me. Marketing doesn't work for me. Like you can't sell this way in my business, right? And so people want to shorten a problem into yes, it works, no, it doesn't work when so much of business and problem solving is understanding the nuance between where we're starting and where we're going. And it's to what extent has Facebook not worked, right? Where is the fall off? right? It is not that it doesn't work. It is just, we only got it to work this percent, right? Now we need to get all the way over the hump to get there, but it's to what extent. And I think that when I, when, if you, if you can ask the right questions, if you can see the problems as they truly are, they become far more solvable. And so this has been probably, I just gave you two of my, my best frames that I think with all the time. All right. So I'll say these again. So the first uh, mental lapse I'll say that I see all the time is mistaking a dichotomy that needs to be managed for a problem that needs to be solved. People do this in their marriages as well, right? So you look at your wife, right? <laughs> you look at your wife and you're like, I need more variety, right? But later you're like, I need more consistency. And you're like, I, we have to figure this out. We need variety, we need consistency. It's like, yes, you need both, right? And so it's not a problem to be solved, it's a dichotomy to be managed. Why are you trying to change people's perception of you when you can just change who you are and let their perceptions catch up? The only way you're going to change your reputation is by being different. He's like, you need to stop being this person that does all these things and your reputation will catch up. And even if it doesn't, you'll always know. I, and I, honestly, it barely scratched the surface because my ego was so high and I was like, no, I just have to think of a better way to like market myself. But I ended up knowing that he was very serious about the threat of pulling me out of school if I didn't get my grades up. And so what I ended up doing for the next half of the semester of my first semester of freshman year is I didn't go out at all. I didn't drink anymore. I really didn't like hang out with girls at all. And all I did was study. And I was able to pull my, it might've been one, two. It was very low, up to a 3.2 for the semester, which basically meant I got an A on everything from that point for the rest of the semester. And so when I went back home, he was like, well, now you know you can do it. And so we should always expect that that is what you're gonna get from here on out. And it also kind of proved it to myself too. I was like, I guess I can do this. And you know what happened is after I started switching that way, people still thought of me as a whore. And I still had to deal with that. It took like two years to really reverse the reputation that I had acquired in the first three months. I think during that period of time, I grew an appreciation for how easy it is, especially in first impressions, to set the wrong one, and how hard it is to overcome a negative impression. And my reputation overall, the realization I had was, there's too many people that you're interacting with in the world to try and curate reputation. The only way to change your reputation is to change who you are. 
Reputation is fundamentally just what people say about you to your face and behind your back. I'm not saying that you need to care about what everyone else thinks. That's not really the point of this. It's much more, if one person says you're an asshole, whatever. If every person you know says you're an asshole, like you might be an asshole. And so if you have one of those situations where you feel like the proof or the evidence is overwhelming and you might even believe it, then it's probably you. I think that for me, getting out of the whole, like I can control this and try and curate what people think about me and transitioning to be like, at the end of the day, I'm the only person who knows who I am and I don't like who I am. And just saying like, well, how can I get to a point where I would like me? Even if everyone else hated me, how can I like me? When I started operating from that place, it really changed my life because then I started thinking like, what version of me do I want to be? And what does that guy do? Well, that guy studies really hard and that guy works out really hard. And that guy's a really good friend. He's always respectful, doesn't have an ego. And it took me a long time and I still work on this stuff. You know what I mean? I'm not saying I'm done by any, any search of the imagination, but I think that if you can simply shift the perspective of like, I'm going to try and appear this way to like, I want to be this way. If it just so happens to get captured, great. And if it doesn't, Great. And there's this, this quote by Epictetus that I'm probably going to butcher, but he says, if you need someone else to tell you something about yourself, you are out of integrity because you can always be your own witness. I think that that's a, a great point to wrap the this little video lesson up with because that piece strikes to the core of everything, which is we are our own witnesses. And if we want to change our reputation, we need to change our reputation with ourselves first. And then eventually it will reflect in the world. Recently, I had uh, some of our some of our older OG gym lords who've been a while. You know, I mean, they 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 turn their gym around, they've grown, they're at you know you know close to seven figures or right around there, and they've been doing it for a while. And they were complaining about show rates. They're like, "Hey, our show rates are low." And um, you know, you go through the sand. Well, you're doing the reminders. You're doing all this stuff. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, 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 we're doing all this stuff. Like, okay, cool. And uh, I dig a little bit deeper, and I look, and it turns out that they're only open one hour per day at 7.15 a.m. for their availability availability for, for new clients. And I'm like, how the f do you think that you're going to grow your business if the only time that you can take new customers is at 7.15 a.m.? In what world does that make sense, right? Like imagine a grocery store that's only open from 7 to, to 7.30 because that's when it's convenient for the owner. What chance do you think that that, that grocery store has at succeeding? Virtually none. And so... What happens is people have success. They implement tactics. They use gym watch and then they make money, right? And then what happens? They get comfortable. They get complacent, right? And they lose their hunger. Like after that point, everything, like it's almost like, I was gonna say like, after, you, after you've like quote made it in your mind and that's what's funny is that making it in some people's mind is like having 10 grand in their bank account. So like it's scary in terms of what level of making it is. But like once people have made it, I almost want to say like, none of these tactics matter because you're just not hungry. Like it doesn't matter. Like the obvious shit you aren't doing. You know what I mean? If your child was going to die or your spouse or your significant other, your family member, whatever it was, was going to die unless you succeeded, unless you got more clients, unless you made more money with your gym, how would you approach it, right? Would you only be available for one hour a day? Would you only be available from 7 to 8 a.m.? Would you only set aside an hour a day to prospect for new customers? Would you only reach out to your existing customers if they hadn't shown up for a month? Sometimes people ask questions that they already know the answer to. It's like, duh, no shit, right? And, and, and it goes back to the, the, the main thing, which is like, what drives you? Right? Like, what drives you? What drives you to be better? What drives you to continue to want to win? I was asked that question yesterday by the, the gym owners that were here. And I think, honestly, it comes from a dark place. And I think I've said this before, but like, I'm saying it again because I think people need to hear it. Sometimes you have to wonder, like, why is it that only when someone else's life is on the line, do you then actually try, right? Like, why is it only then you actually cut all the noise out of your life and then it would go laser focused on actually succeeding? Like, why can't we do that all the time, right? Like, why can't we do that? Because it's like, well, then I wouldn't be happy, whatever, right? And like whatever happiness means, right? And so the people who are the most successful in the world are driven by something that is deep inside of them that is normally an insecurity or a fear of some sort. If you are only trying to make enough to live on, you will always only make enough to live on. And you will slack the moment you get comfortable and you will wonder, why is it that as soon as I start making money, I stop? Because you actually don't want to make more. That's why. 
you actually don't want to make more. And so your internal motivation is not, is not there like because you've accomplished what you set out to accomplish. The real question is, do you actually want what you claim to want? Do you actually want it? Because if you did, you'd already have it. You'd already, you'd already be willing to sacrifice other things in order to achieve it. And that might mean like maybe waking up earlier, maybe like working four to 8 PM to take sales appointments or whatever that thing is. It's just the obvious. Shit. Like if you were coaching you, what would you recommend you to do? Right? Like a lot of times, if you think about it, like you most of the time know what to do. Like you do on some level, like you probably know that you're like, man, I do stupid shit sometimes, right? You probably think that on some level sometimes, right? Then you're like, man, if I were, if you could step out of yourself and say, I need to coach myself, you probably have the answer. And it's just that you don't do it for some reason. And so all of your attention should be on that reason. Why is it that this thing is preventing me from doing the things that I already know I should do? For me, a very core belief that has been, I think, intrinsic to at least the material success that we've experienced has been a belief that meaning is self-ascribed. So that there is no inherent meaning in the things that we do um, or the actions we take or the outcomes that happen, uh, but only that which we ascribe to it. Um, and so because of that, I feel like it's allowed me to the point of what you were saying about like the amount of pain and the amount of suffering that you have to go through in order to, to achieve the things on the other side. I think it's been able to, it's allowed me to reframe a lot of the discomfort into what if this just is, is how it always has been? Or what if this is actually amazing? And what if this is exactly what it should look like? And so I think a lot of times it's the, it's the discrepancy between our expectations and reality that shape the emotions that we have in response to any given situation, bad, good, et cetera. And so I think a lot of people can't control their state. And I, we deal with this with a lot of the portfolio companies is it's like, it's funny cause I don't even necessarily want to get in this. I want to talk about like the business and what's the strategy and how we're going to execute this stuff. But you know, there's a big percentage of time where they're stressed and they think there's something wrong with that. Mm. And so I feel like a lot of people feel like there's something wrong with experiencing human emotions. And so, they are stressed and then think there's something wrong with them or they are sad. And I know that this is the thing that the keyboards are, you know, their, their, their fingers are right on top of it. It's my belief. It is contrary. And I accept that, that it's, it's the beliefs we have about our emotions that are the things that drive us mad facts. And so somebody's sad and then they tell themselves there's, that they're, they're bad because they're sad or they're wrong to be sad or they're a piece of shit because they're sad. Um, rather than saying, isn't this a beautiful thought about the human existence? Like if I could not be sad, then I would not experience joy. Mm. So like, if I say that I don't want to be sad anymore, then I would also have to give up joy. Am I willing to do that? No. Well, then this is just a part. Like, I can't say that I want sunny days if there are no rainy days. Like we don't say weather is good or bad. It just is. And so I think to the same degree, the human experience is also that way too, at least how I define it. And so I think having that as my backbone frame in terms of my worldview, although contrarian, has helped me a lot in dealing with the things that often derail entrepreneurs on their path to getting what they want. Mm. And so for me, that's been very helpful. So from a contrarian standpoint of like, you know, Peter Thiel's question, like what closely I believe you have that most people don't agree with, that's one of them. Envy is having the, the desire for something that someone else has that you do not have. So you are lacking and someone else has something that you want and do not have. That is envy. Jealousy is when you have a threat that somebody is going to take something that you have that they do not have, all right? And so, for example, I'll give you an example of each. So envy, I may be envious of a friend of mine. So um, I was actually talking to a good friend of mine who owns a big weight loss company, and right now, he's doing better than I am. And now I am envious of his success. I am, I can feel it. I'm envious, I got off the phone, and I was like, I am envious of you, right? On the flip side, if someone comes to talk to Layla, right? It is the fact that they pose the threat of taking attention or her attention that I think should continuously belong to me that I would feel jealous over. I haven't had, I haven't felt jealousy in a long time, um, but that is that is an example. It could also be like with your kids. If you have some, you know, some other adult in their life starts taking their attention or has more influence over them, you are jealous of the influence that that person is now th is threatening your influence over your child, right? So two examples, they're nuanced, but I think it's important. And when I was talking to Nick Barely about this, I was talking about how I think envy um, gets a bad rap. And I'm not going to go into the spiritual religious side of this or even the happiness side of this, because I think envy absolutely does not make you happy. 
But I do think that envy will make you successful. All right. And so this, this is where I want to kind of dive into this. Envy is adaptive, right? As human beings, this is actually from our old brain, right? This is animals have this too. They are envious of one another. And it's because if in a group, one person or one being, one animal, whatever, brings more to the table, you are now envious of that person. And what it does is it elevates the rest of the group to go and achieve the same, which is good for the collective. Not happier for each of the individuals, but as a pro-survival tool, right? And so for me, understanding this and at least being able to name the emotion rather than saying, I don't like this guy or I'm angry at this person or having this negative feeling that you cannot put words to, instead being able to say, I am envious has been very relieving for me because now I can actually tell those people, hey, I'm envious of you. And for some reason, I think it just creates another level of candor because it's a certain level of vulnerability and saying, you have something that I wish I had, but then you'll notice that the conversation is not defensive on that person's part. Most of the time they're like, well, let me help you. And it's only when we guise our intentions or, or, try and, or try and feign, you know, pretend to be a different way than we are, where people also can sense that you're being disingenuous. Like, great job, man, right? When realize deep down, and they can tell from your, your subtle tonality changes and the way you look, that the, um, that you're actually not happy for them, right? And so I think if you can at least say it, then it actually gives you power. Now, in terms of judging your motivations, because obviously you might think that envy is a bad uh, motivation. It is my belief that I would rather deal with people who do good things for bad reasons than bad reasons for good things. Um, or I said the same thing twice, but uh, they do the right thing for the wrong reasons rather than the wrong things for the right reason. All right, I'd rather someone who does the right outcome. And he gave me an example that was really powerful. He said a friend of his um, was a top Navy SEAL and uh, you know, one of the best Navy SEALs. He trains Navy SEALs, just a total badass, right? And before that, he was an EMT. And he talked about his experiences being an EMT is that most people think you know, EMTs have to be really caring. They, you want them to, you know, they have to save these people's lives every day. And he said, uh, the Navy SEAL was saying, I was not compassionate at all. I didn't really care that much about the person who was on the table in front of me. But what I did care about was my stats. I cared about the status of being the best. I wanted to have the fastest to the hospital. I want to have the highest survival rates, highest success rates of the people that were under my care because I cared about myself being the best. And so the question is, if you were the person who was on the table having a heart attack, would you rather have the compassionate EMT or would you rather have the self-interested EMT who is doing it for status? Well, if it were me, I'd rather have the guy who wanted to pride himself on being the best in the world and didn't give him care about me at all because I knew his result was going to be more pro me than the other person's. And so I think that as, as humans, as entrepreneurs, we judge ourselves a lot on our motivations and our, in and our intentions. But I think that if we can take a step back and A, name the emotion so that it's not this amorphous thing that we can't understand, but then take the next step and say, is this, is this a pro-adaptive uh, emotion? Is this something that's going to help me? Or is this an emotion that's going to drive me to do something that is negative? And I think at least even, even in naming that, we can increase the time between emotion and action. And the further that time gap is in general, the better the quality of the decisions we make because the more rational we are. We're never completely rational because we're, we're emotion-driven beings and we have limbic systems that override things. But the more we can decrease the triggers, uh, the emotional triggers that, that cause us to make bad decisions, ultimately the better decisions we make. And so... I, I, I say all this to say, big picture, first, naming the emotions is important. Second, it creates space so we can make better decisions. Third, we can analyze those decisions and say, is this something that is going to help me in my life or is this something that's going to hurt me? And then as a result of this, we don't have to judge ourselves as strongly on why we are doing things and rather what is being done. Uh, because candidly, I am a very envious individual, and maybe this is me just um, rationalizing my own negative, you know, emotions. Who knows? Um, but at least for me, saying it that way and framing the thought process in that way has helped me feel uh, better about myself, um, and just not, or really just less bad, if that's probably a better way of saying it, um, and not constantly berating myself for having desires that I think are wrong. And so uh, Dan Sullivan said this, and I'll end with this, is that 
when people want something, if you want to make more money, if you want to have a bigger house, you want to have a bigger car, you want to build a podcast studio, whatever, right? He said, wanting is reason enough. Because so many times we ask, but why do we want that? We're probably not going to change the desire. And so letting, us, letting ourselves desire things and giving ourselves permission to desire things, uh, and myself specifically, um, has been incredibly freeing. And what it's done is given me a tremendous amount of my attention back that used to be allocated to analyzing why I'm feeling this way or why this is right or why this is wrong. And instead accepting the fact that I want something and that wanting it is okay, as long as it is not something that is hurting other people and that is not something that is hurting me. In a perfect world, if everyone had absolute information and everyone was unbelievably well-trained and you had a great infrastructure and all that stuff, then yes, the more products and services you offer, in theory, you would make more money. But we don't live in that theoretical world most of the time and most small business owners are not that good at operating, right? It's the number one issue they have. They're super disorganized. They feel like they're spinning their wheels all day. Their team completely has no idea what, which way they're going. They change things all the time, et cetera. And so in an effort to combat that, we have used this process over and over again and it has worked very well. So it is as follows. We sell two things and I've done this in virtually every business that I've ever owned. We sell two things two products or two services, and this is once we're going from one to 10 million. All right, zero to one million, you sell one product to one service, one avatar, all right? That's it, one channel, one product, one avatar. That's it, all right? But once you're going from one to, you know, one to three-ish million and you're trying to go to 10, you introduce the second product line. And so here's how this works. If you have two things that you sell, you'll have a front end thing and you'll have a back end thing. We can still have a, a massive accommodation in the buying curve based on the payment terms that we introduce. So for example, people will look at their monthly expense more than the total contract value. That's a huge money hack I'm giving you right now. This is a wealth hack. This is something that will build, make you a fortune in your life if you can properly understand this. People do not look at the length or the total contract they're signing. They will only pay attention to what is it going to cost me every month because no one is good with their money. All right, so they only look at the cash flow expense month over month over month and they just think, can I make it happen? Yes, cool, I'll sign. They don't think about the total contract value. For you as a business owner, the contract value matters almost more than anything. So I'll give you a quick hack on this. Total side note, tangent for you, life hack. Pro tip, if you want to extend the contract value that you have, I have a saying, which is the bigger the head, the longer the tail, all right? And so what that means is, the more you can get someone to pay upfront and relative to the upfront cost of signing up or what they paid down, the lower their contractual recurring payment is, the stickier it will be. So I'll give you an example. If I had someone sign up for $99 a month for whatever, it doesn't matter, that price point might be medium sticky depending on the value that I have. Now imagine I had someone pay $5,000 down and $99 a month after that. How much more sticky would it be? Significantly more sticky. Now, the beauty is if you have one of these upfront type payments, you can also use that to liquidate your ad costs, cover your commissions for the salesperson, cover the upfront uh, fulfillment and onboarding, which is gonna cost more for a new customer than an existing customer. And so you can build all that in. If you know that the thing that you are selling has very high gross margins, then you can still have a lower cost as long as you know that the person is going to stay for a long time. And so based on how you structure the pricing, you can actually get some, you can use the pricing to actually get people to stick longer. Pro tip complete. That is it. Moving back to the original thing that I was talking about. In one of our portfolio companies, we actually had this as a really in-depth discussion that we had to make a decision about, all right? And so they had a different you know, mentor, person, whatever, advice, uh, who told them that they should have three products. And they should have a, you know, a low, a medium, and a high product, and then based on uh, you know, what the salesman thought, the salesman would sell them the low, medium, or high. In my experience, it is not that effective. And that is because the salesperson can't decide which of these things they're trying to sell most of the time. And so what we have found is more effective is you give the salesperson the one dream to sell. This thing is going to solve this person's problem and we make it the most valuable thing that we're trying to sell because at the end of the day, you do want to solve the, the customer's problem, right? We do want to actually make sure that we're providing value. Rather than having a diet, a medium, and a, and a great, right? Simply having one thing that solves all the problems and then based on the, the customer's budget, we can decrease how they pay, all right? So hear me out. 
So let's say that uh, we want to do a, uh, this is a, a six month implementation of whatever kind of solution you sell. If you have a six month duration, you can have the person A, pay the entire thing up front. So that would be for somebody who has a, the, the highest budget. Version two would be a split pay. Version three might be three payments, right, with at 20% higher. And then finally, you might have a, a have a, have a, you know, a six pay or whatever over that period of time. So one, two, three, six. Now, here's the cool thing. The more payment options you provide, the higher your conversions are. That's proven, all right? So the more options you give someone to pay, the more people will buy, period. Now, you might not make more cash flow because if you give your sales guy more options, then they might use the, the end of defaulting to the lower ones, right? But if you have one thing to sell, then they only have one thing to convince the person of because a confused mind doesn't buy. If you have too many options, the salesman won't know what to sell and the prospect won't know what to buy. And so I prefer when I'm coming into a portfolio company, I'm thinking, what is this true problem that we are solving with this business for what avatar? And we make that the main thing and we communicate it clearly in the scripting and the salesperson has clarity on what they are selling and they're always solving the same thing. And so the question becomes no longer which of these things are you going to buy, but once you are buying, how would you like to pay? And so then the discussion is around what payment plan is best for them rather than what product is best for them. And so by doing that, you can get people to go between different payment terms. That is not gonna change whether they're gonna buy. But if they're unsure about which product is going to best suit their needs and the salesman doesn't know, because at the end of the day, he's just trying to sell the most expensive thing, then you'll have way more confused people who leave unsold. So this is a single tactic that you can use to execute within your business, which is why I'm a big fan of making offers people cannot say no to, is that you can focus all of your sales and all of your persuasion attempts on selling the one thing, which is getting them to say yes. Once they say yes, we can, we can reach the, we can accommodate their wealth and their budget based on the payment terms that we provide. And if we have done, or we have structured our offer properly, the offer in and of itself should already be very high gross margins, which means whether or not the person pays $1,000 a month or $100 a month, it's still almost all margin for us because of how we structure the thing that we are selling. And so we are able to capture higher LTVs by getting the people who have more money to prepay the thing up front. That is how we do it. And with those people, you'll be able to ascend into the second thing faster because they've already prepaid that thing. And then you can solve the next natural problem in another sales conversation rather than trying to pick all of the things in one conversation, which makes it incredibly difficult to do. This is just for everyone, again, a broad brushstroke of statements for most entrepreneurs who are not very good at operating their businesses, uh, her operations is not their strong suit and are below $3 million a year. Because you made it this far in a video, I want to celebrate you. Most people start and don't finish. Most people never actually follow through. Most people say they want something, but they don't ever do the work to actually get it. But you are different. You are special. Believe Nation, you made it here all the way to the end, and I love you. So it's a special celebration if you put a hashtag believe down in the comments below on this video. I will showcase you and celebrate you somewhere on the screen in a future video because you are awesome. For 10 more amazing rules from Tom Bilyeu, check the video right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe and I'll see you there. There are certain habits that basically all wealthy people have in common that you guys can put to use in your life. And the first one is gonna be the most controversial, but I could not feel more strongly about this. They make no excuses.